If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. If you have the same vision as International Horse College, which is to have a world where people safely appreciate, respect and enjoy their horses, and the horses appreciate, respect and enjoy their people, then have a look at their website, internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation 31352. Today's guest, Stephanie Pekovic, is a freelance coach. She's been working, she was working in a riding school and she's transitioning now to having her own riding school but working as a freelance coach in between. Stephanie, how are you today? I'm good, thanks, Glennis. How are you? Good, good. Stephanie, tell us about your favourite quote, just so people can get to know you a little bit more. You know, sometimes favourite quote can indicate a person's philosophy before we even start. Well, my favourite quote is actually one from Monty Roberts, and it's, if you act like you've got 15 minutes, it will take all day. Yep. Act like you've got all day, and it will take 15 minutes. Yep, yep. That's so true. Oh, yeah. It is very true. And it's sort of like when horses start to test your patience, or like when you're when you're working with anything, especially to do with horses, they pick up on on how you're feeling, and yeah. you've got to stay nice and relaxed and go with the flow, really, with it. Now, Stephanie, when did you learn that, and was there a lesson in it? You know, sometimes people can pick up a saying and say, "Oh, I wish I'd have known that then," and and really made a lesson from it. Look, I really learned that when I bought my my Welsh pony. Now, I think everyone knows that ponies definitely test your patience. Yep. And it really, really did come to when I was first first starting out with him, and he was he was a bit testing. And I was watching Monty Roberts online, and he said that quote, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to try that with my pony and see how I go. And it really did work. And just just by saying that quote over and over again, just mm-hmm. gave me the patience while I'm in the paddock, even just trying to catch when you've got a, a naughty pony trying to catch one. Yep. Generally, when I say that, <laughs> saying to myself. Okay. Now tell us then, that, you know, that was one memory. Have you got any other earlier memory where you had a lesson about horses? Probably I've learned all my lessons from a young age around my, my grandfather, Carol Dorman. Now he's a pop and he's in the racing industry and that's probably where I first got my love for horses. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, yeah, just everything that I learned all my basics off of him. And another big thing is, is safety, really. Yeah. What did he teach you about safety? He just taught me to be very weary of horses. Now, as everyone knows, you know, thoroughbreds are highly strung and you've got to, that's when you've got to be really careful around them. And it was actually one of the horses in his stable. His name was Robbie George and he was a sour old bugger. And any time you would walk behind you, he would lift up his back leg and put his ears back and act like he was going to kick you. <laughs> now, I was petrified of this horse. And Pop taught me all the ways to get around him because I used to have to call out to Pop to get me to walk behind him every single time. <laughs> all right. Now, any particular tricks? What did he tell you about getting around the back of that horse? Was it to be more confident, to be in a certain position? It was. It was, it was definitely to be more confident. He taught me where to stand, where not to stand. Yeah, we're safe. Um, yeah, just taught me all the basic safeties. And mm-hmm. I really I stress that a lot to anyone that I'm, anyone that I'm teaching or or guiding or showing safe ground, especially groundwork. Okay, okay. Now, having a career with horses is one thing, but you've gone, you've worked in a riding school, you've worked in quite a big riding school, and you've decided now that you're going to have a riding school yourself and you're working towards that. So you're Uh freelancing now in preparation for getting your own property, but what was it about working in a riding school that made you think, this is what I want to do. I want to do this for me one day. It was actually when I first started learning to ride. Mm-hmm. I, I went to one riding school and it wasn't quite right. And then I went to another riding school um, in Glasshouse Mountains. And I went there and 
that coach was just absolutely incredible. She was yep. inspiring. The the environment that she provided for all of myself and all my long life friends that I've made from there was just at a writing school like I've never been at before. And I remember in those moments I was like, this is what I want to provide yep. for kids one day. I want a property where people can come and learn in a fun environment, in a safe manner, and just be nice and relaxed around the horses and enjoy them. Because mm-hmm. when you kids, well, that's all you want to do. You want to just have fun with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you can do that all day, then your life's made, isn't it, you know? That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, if the kids that are coming, you know, they're looking for that fun environment, those then, because some of those kids will be like you and go on and work in the horse industry. Are there any kids that, that you think stand out? Are there any particular traits that you're looking for with those young kids that you think, oh, these people are going to make it in the horse industry? Just the eagerness of them, the mm-hmm. eagerness to learn and what like and having fun at the same time, you can just tell that those kids will just go a long way. Yep. Yep. All right then. The type of horse that you'd be looking for in that environment. What sort of horse? Yeah, typical like no horse is bomb proof, mm-hmm. but you're quiet, been there, done that. Anything just to gain your confidence on. And after you've got your confidence on a horse, then that's when you would step it up. A mark, I would say, to get something a little bit outside your comfort zone. Okay, okay. But if you're looking for a horse as a horse business owner, because you're going to come into that soon, you know, you're going to be, say, right, well, I've got my property, I'm starting to look for my horses now. What sort of horse are you looking? Where are you going to look? You're saying about none of them are being bomb-proof, but we want them as close to it as we can, you know, realising that they are live animals and they do act on instinct. What else can you say to look for a horse? What type of horse are you looking that would do the job of a riding school horse? I always, whenever I'm test riding a horse, especially Mm. for, you know, kids learning to ride, I'll always get on their back and, you know, really, really do test them. Like wave your arms about, clap your hands, you know, just if you're trotting along, try and like purposely lose your balance for a second and see how they react to that. The best, like I always find some of the best horses will always slow down and they'll, they'll keep their eye on you. You'll see their ears flicking back and forth, just making sure that you're okay. Mm-hmm. And if they feel yourself go a little bit unsteady, they'll either stay at the same pace trot to see if you get your balance back or they'll come back down to their walk. That's probably one of the most important things as well that I look for on the horse. Yep, yep, yep. So working in a big environment, working for someone else, what do you think the biggest challenge is that you wouldn't necessarily have when you're working for yourself? It's, it really is just making sure that you don't lose your style of teaching. So mm-hmm. Everyone's got a different criteria that they need you to follow. Definitely follow that. Learn everything that you can for them. But the hardest thing is definitely trying to keep your style because, as everyone knows, you get along with some coaches and you don't get along with others. But the coach that you do get along with generally is, you know, you like their style. Yeah, yeah, so just yeah. Trying not to lose that when you're going in and out of different riding schools is, the main thing. What about students that you've started off? You know, have you got any case studies that you'd like to mention, students that you might have started off not being very confident to move on? Um, I actually love working with, I've, I've taught uh, some little some little kids with disabilities mm-hmm. and I, I've got to say that they're, they're really rewarding to work with, just seeing them, you know, really connect to the horse and then when they get something and, you know, it takes you it can take you up to 12 lessons. I, I, I did teach this little boy named Adam. Now, when he used to sit on, he used to slouch, but, and, you know, he wasn't quite, you know, he couldn't hold himself up properly. And it's like his first instinct was just, just go back and slouch like he's sitting on a couch. But, yep. uh, you know, it took, it took a good 12 lessons, I think it was. And just by looking back to when he first started to, after that 12 lessons, he was sitting up, he was starting to use his core more and, yeah. That yeah. was definitely one of yeah. that was really rewarding for myself as a coach. And and something like like an able bodied person, if you just said to them, sit up, use your core, be in a better position, they can do it in in a moment, in an instant. But it is, it's very rewarding. And it may have taken you twelve lessons, twelve weeks, twelve fortnights, whatever. But to them it's a really big deal. And if it's really improved their life, um, it makes it more rewarding for you, doesn't it? It does. Mm. And just seeing anyone when when any rider goes in unconfident with something and just as a coach, 
coming out, however many lessons later, it could be one, it could be 10, it could be, it could take three months. But once they get that confidence on that subject that you're teaching them on, yeah. it's just, it really does just bring that smile and joy and it makes your job well worth it. Sure, sure. What's the best thing about being an instructor? Uh, I would say working, except like just what I just said, just seeing them excel with what they love to do because yep. I don't think anyone who learns to ride isn't just learning to ride because they don't want to. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they want to be there learning and it's, they love it. And yep. just seeing them succeed and, and really just seeing them enjoy the horse. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, thinking forward and thinking about yourself with your own riding school, money aside, okay, because we know that that's always going to be a problem when you're setting up, when you're buying a property, you know, setting up a new business, of course you want always want better than what you can afford or what the, you've got the cash flow for. But money aside, what other challenges do you think you're going to have as you prepare to set up your own riding school? I think just finding the right horses. Because uh-huh. as, a, as a coach, you've got to have, you've got to teach horses on that you really trust. And as we all know, it can take a little while to build up trust in a horse and mm-hmm. That's definitely going to be a difficult thing. So as like everything that I do now is definitely if I see a horse that I like, I, I'll start saving for that horse and see if I can bring it on board now. So in five years' time, I've got that trust and I've got that bond with the horse that I can put anyone on him or her yep. and know that they're going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. What about staff? Do you plan to have other staff or just yourself? I do. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't mm-hmm. mind getting to that stage where I'm I'm teaching one or two people and then just as I'm starting out, just showing them like I did with Pop, like well, like Pop did with me, sorry, you know, teaching them the basic fundamentals and safety around a horse. Yep. It, yep. it just, yeah, just teaching people and letting them express themselves in the horse industry. So, yeah, one day I would love to have my own staff and especially school-based and, you know, give them that opportunity because not many people do in the horse industry these days. Mm, mm. To give the staff the opportunity, you mean, to be able to train the staff, yeah, is that what you're saying? Yep. Especially, yeah, young people that don't have that experience. Yep. You know, yep. give them that experience mm-hmm. and understanding so then they can go out and get jobs. Yep, yep, yep. Thinking of people that come in, you know, beginner riders that come in, what do you think is a problem that they might have? And this is a common problem or something that you see often in beginner riders. What would you like to talk about there? As long as when you get a horse, just try and sit up, try yep. and engage your core, and it really is just try and listen and feel what the horse is doing. In the walk, there's four beats, one, two, three, four, and just see if you can – you don't want to interrupt the horse. You want to try and flow with them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest thing that most beginner riders have is the confidence, but then once they get to the trot, the trot is the hardest. Don't feel bad about not getting it straight away. You will get there. It really is one of the the hardest hardest things to get on horse. Yes, yes. When you're teaching trot diagonals, do you teach the correct diagonal first or do you teach them to change their diagonal first? I will, we always go into a bit of a so – when they first start trotting into a sit trot yep. and then I'll just focus on the rise and after they get the rise, then that's when I'll start introducing the diagonal. Yep, so once they've, got the, once they've developed the rising trot rhythm. Yeah, mm-hmm. look, it's the hardest thing. If you haven't quite got that trot rhythm and then we're asking you to do something else in the trot, it's a bit flustering. Oh, for sure, for sure, yeah, yeah. What about riding school owners? We've talked about faults of beginners coming in. Well, riding school owners, you know, you, you've sort of been around a bit and you would have seen a few different riding schools. What's something that you think as a general that you would like to make different in your school that you don't see other schools doing? Look, there's some there's some riding schools out there that, you know, it's it's okay not to be perfect. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, if you've got a rider that you think you can push just a little bit beyond their their capabilities, you know, give them that little bit of an extra go. Don't hold them back, hold them back, hold them back. They need to they need to take that step forward just to see their boundaries, not leave them wanting to move forward, but then you're holding them back so much. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's that's a little plot that I've seen in them. Yeah, for safety. I mean, because there is a balance, isn't there? You oh. know, getting the safety, making keeping the riders safe, but at the same time allowing them to expand their boundaries to where they're ready. Yeah, look, it's a tricky balance. Mm. And especially when you get into, like, the bigger riding schools where you're, 
the manager isn't keeping an eye on everything and some of like some of the coaches do just want to make sure that their riders are safe and they just sort of stick with what they know but you know like let the riders you know try different things and be there for them and coach them through it because the coaches know what they're doing yeah but riding skill learners just you know like encourage your coaches to go outside the box with their riders if you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Do you think that's more training for the riding school coaches? I think it does have a little bit to do with it. Yeah. Um, training coaches for the riding school is obviously strict. You know, they try and get you to stay by the book. Yeah. I'm thinking the riding school owner you know, the riding school owner, to maybe spend the time training the coaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it makes your coaches feel much more comfortable and capable. And, you know, as much as riding school owners, your coaches encourage your kids to ride, riding school owners need to encourage their coaches to coach, mm-hmm. you know, give them give them their reward, tell them what they're doing wrong, yes, but make sure you're encouraging them with what they're doing right. And yes. definitely letting them express their style of coaching as well. So that's that's part of the business planning, really, of a school, isn't it? It is. You know, to have that professional development, the regular professional development for coaches, for staff, as, as you would in any business, but that particularly will develop the style then of the riding school and the, um, the type of business that it is. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. All right. Now, Stephanie, if you've got a book that you'd like to recommend to our listeners, something that's going to complement what we've talked about today, to complement their training. Look, I, I haven't got one particular book, but yep. I've got a bookshelf of how to <laughs> on how to ride. Yep. It, just the more that you can read about anything, you can take into your lessons and ask your coaches what you think. Mm. You've got one book that says one thing or another book that says the other. You know, join those two together, ask your coach, and your coach will be able to produce you with the best possible answer. That's going to work for you. Yes. Because that's what it's all about. It's about finding what works best for you. Mm, mm. So get as much as you can. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes as a coach, the coach is going to say, do one thing one time and another thing another time. And it'll be the same coach, same horse, what you think is the same situation, but you're working, you know, and that's the coach's experience coming in, saying not just having one trick or one, you know, one thing that they do, but let's try this, let's try that. And um, there's yeah. not just one way to ride a horse, there's multiple ways, you know, all looking towards the same thing. Yeah. But there's lots of different ways to go about it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, away from horse riding, though, no, definitely mm. a book that I think every horse owner or any anyone to do with the horse industry is like The Complete Guide. Um, the complete veterinarian manual. Yes, yes, is, very is, good. If you've got, oh, I love that book. Yeah, it is yeah. my go-to for anything. If you see a horse with a runny nose, yep. go to that book, see what the symptoms are, and just you know deal with it that way. So you don't, you're not always calling up your vet. You know, try and problem solve for yourself unless it's something serious. But even after your vet's come out and he's told you some big word that you don't know, <laughs> you can go back to that book, you can look it up, and you can read about it, and it's. It's fabulous. It's my Bible. Yeah, yeah. And I think just learning more about anatomy, physiology, it, it really helps. Oh, yeah, especially with your riding as well. If you know how the horse, you know, with skeleton and muscles are moving, yes. You, yes. you'll be able to, you'll get on the horse and you'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling that. Like I read that and I'm yeah. like, now I can, I know what that muscle is doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you looking forward to now, Stephanie? I know that you're teaching your mother to ride. Is that exciting? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, she, she could be one of my difficult clients, but she actually <laughs> enjoys it just as much as, as just as much as I enjoy it. And any particular reason that she's decided that that she's going to start riding? Uh, she decided to start riding because of me. Actually, when I yeah. first started to own my horses, I was fourteen, and obviously I couldn't drive myself back and forth from the from the horses because we didn't live on property. So yeah. she would stay there and she would help me. And you know, obviously, her father and my my grandfather is you know, into horses as a mm-hmm. trainer. So yep. she grew up around them. But, yeah, once her daughter got into it and she very well got amongst it with me and she's been my rock solid, my supporter, my go-to and everything, and she's incredible. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, fabulous. All right. Now, just in a few sentences, you want to summarise your philosophy with horses? I would say set yourself some goals, keep mm-hmm. moving forward, and just have fun. 
do what you love and you won't work a day in your life. And I think everyone needs to needs to do that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good about not working a day in your life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because horses are challenging. So you got to make sure that you, you love what you're doing. Yes. You will come across some really hard days. Yes, definitely, definitely. I remember my boss um, said to me once, you know, like, oh, I do this and I get paid for it. And lots of other people do it just for fun, you know, but I'm getting paid yeah. for it. And that was, yeah. you know, and I thought, yeah, yeah, you're right. Because a lot of people go out, work all week, have a job, then come back in and do stuff with horses, whereas we get to do it all the time. It's fabulous. Mm-hmm. It's, I think we're the real winners here. Yes, yes, for sure. Do for sure. All day. Yeah. All right. Now, how can people contact you? Oh, they can contact me over the, over the phone. Yep. On O four O two five five two one eight four, or they're more than welcome to send me an email on Steph dot Pekovich at gmail dot com, which is S T E P H dot P E J K O V I C at gmail dot com. All right. Now those details as well will be on horsechats dot com slash Stephanie Pekovich. Or if you didn't get the peck of it, just go to horsechats.com and search for Stephanie with the P-H, so S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E, and you'll find Steph's details at the bottom of her page on Horse Chats. So, Stephanie, thank you for talking to us today. I'm wishing you well with your search. I'd like to talk to you again and just, you know, I know you've got lots of other ideas about horses and training and and business management and things like that, so I'd like to talk to you a bit more about it. But meanwhile, thanks for talking to us and we'll catch up with you again soon. No worries, Glenna. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 